Absolutely, that? thank you. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. Hello. So whenever I hear people talk about my background, it reminds me of what happens when I go talk at colleges. People ask me for career advice, and I always say, what you do in university is very important preparation for what your career will be. I spent my time in college running, drinking beer, and oversleeping, which was a perfect preparation for working at Nike, and then Coors, and then Starwood. So um, anyway, it's great to be with you guys here all today. And I wanted to start uh, my conversation about disruption by telling you a short story of something that happened to me a few years ago. Uh, I was visiting a country to speak with the Minister of Tourism and then the Prime Minister about the opportunity in travel and tourism as part of their economic development. And I had done this many times around the world in places like Bhutan and Mexico and Thailand. Uh, and on this particular day, I was talking to them and saying, look, travel and tourism is 12% of global employment, it's 10% of global GDP, uh, it's a great way to have economies develop, but you need airlift and infrastructure, you need accommodations, you need something around attractions, and of course you need to be able to promote and advertise. Um, this particular country had not enjoyed the travel boom that many other countries had, despite the fact that it had 330 sunny days a year, thousands of years of history, and great cuisine. Um, and they thought their, their issue was image, and, and I guess in a way it was, but the real problem was, this was 2011, and I was in Syria, and it was about two weeks before the Civil War broke out. And I'm convinced that not only did I not know it was about what to happen, but the Prime Minister and the Minister of Tourism had no idea. And to me, it was a great metaphor for how change, abrupt, disruptive change, can sneak up on anybody, even if they're, they're in the know. And uh, by the way, I, I came up with my own definition of disruption in this case, which is essentially, you wake up one day, and you realize, you're in trouble, or pick your verb in any case, um, and you either didn't see change coming or you saw it coming and you didn't do enough about it. And as the CEO of a, of a hotel company, I saw this in a significant way with the online travel agencies, the OTAs, a company like Priceline, which owned Booking.com, had a market cap that was greater than Hilton, Marriott, and Starwood put together. And there was this weird couch surfing company called Airbnb, which I completely disregarded, um, which by the time it was the age of your average second grader had more listings than those three companies. And I was just out at their headquarters a few weeks ago and they told me they had a record night of three and a half million people sleeping in their accommodations around the world, which by the way would be 10 times as many as we ever had at Starwood. So disruption is a reality. And, and one of my messages to you is what I call the new definition of insanity. And that is doing the same thing and expecting to get the same result. And in a disruptive world, that's absolutely the opposite of what we need to be doing. Um, and so let's step back and talk about disruption for a minute. I think it's clear to everybody that digital technology is the driving force of disruption today. And while that may be obvious, I think it is worthwhile to consider why that's the case. And there are three things I'd like to point to. The first is just the order of magnitude improvements. So over the course of my lifetime, computing power and performance and cost have improved by like a billion fold, which if that had happened in our agriculture, we could basically feed the world on a farm the size of Central Park here in New York, right? A billion fold improvement. Or if that had happened in air travel since the Wright brothers, we could have gone from here to Beijing in a few seconds and it would have cost us a few cents. So just imagine that one thing alone, that order of magnitude of improvement is a big reason why disruption is such a powerful force. Another aspect to this is what I call the general purpose effect. And it's basically this. There's not a human activity that would not be made better through improved ability to share, manipulate, and store information. And this is true of everything from ordering groceries to cryptocurrencies to launching satellites or dating. Basically, anything that involves the laws of math or physics or fuzzy logic will someday be solved better by a machine than a human being. And the final area, as if that weren't enough, is, that, is, is essentially the network effect, right? And, and I define a network effect simply as this way. If I'm the only one with a phone, it's pretty worthless. If everybody has a phone, it's indispensable. And it used to be that networks were extraordinary barriers to entry. I mean, think of railroad lines, um, telephones, or even having a 1,000 stores. The interesting thing is 
with the internet as a network of networks, those barriers are changing, right? So I launched my book in January of this year. I self-published because I was writing about disruption and it somehow seemed intellectually dishonest to go to a publishing house when I did that. And so I was very happy that Jim Cramer asked me to come on his show. He gets about 200,000 viewers for, for his show. It's his great way of getting some publicity around my book. At the same time, I launched my book on LinkedIn and I actually got 100,000 views of my book launch on LinkedIn. And by the way, I'm not a media company. Right? So there's a big change. Now, the interesting thing is networks are still important barriers to entry, but the way they're created is different. And what do I mean by that? I have a question for you guys. Have you ever heard of Navtech? Anybody? Okay, I've asked thousands of people this question, and so far no one has heard of it. A company called Nokia, which you would have heard of, spent about $8 billion creating a system which was going to help us all drive places and know the best way to go based on sensors and, and information about where traffic was moving. Does anybody here use Waze? Okay, so we know who won that. Now, Waze didn't spend $8 billion. They just signed up a bunch of people. They created a two-sided network natural monopoly, but without anything physical. And so things have changed in the way networks have worked. So the end result of all of this is that companies today, S&P 500 companies, have a life expectancy of something like 15 years. And that number used to be more like 50 or 60 years. And what I think is interesting and somewhat paradoxical about that is you would think, with all this information technology, why wouldn't these big companies just be getting more and more efficient? And the reality is that disruption literally disrupts incumbent companies. They become part of the disruptor's feast. And, and there's a few reasons why that's the case. And the first one is just simple self-interest. People have been standing in the way of technology way back since the Luddites, right? In a way, it's, it's something that industries do well if there's a change that they don't like. It's like the tobacco companies telling us that smoking isn't bad for us. I know some of you work in renewable energy. It's like the fossil fuel companies telling us climate change isn't a problem. Self-interest can be a powerful motivator to stand in the way of new technologies. Uh, in my own industry, in travel and tourism, one of my favorite examples is what was happening in Paris as Uber was coming into that city. The taxi drivers unleashed something they called Operation and this is, this is like almost a joke, but it's actually real. They called it Operation Escargot. They were slowing traffic down to a snail's pace to protest. And of course, it didn't really work for them. But those kind of self-interested barriers to change aren't the only ones. The harder ones are if you have a profitable business. Let's say you have a very valuable and profitable credit card business and a new payment system comes in. You're going to spend more time protecting your own business as the incumbent than really reacting and using new technologies. And so self-interest can be more complicated than, than simply Operation Escargo. Another challenge in the way of disruption is something that I call change blindness. And it goes back to what I remember learning from my economics professors way back in college, where they told me, you should think of people and firms as information-seeking, utility-maximizing, rational decision-makers. Have you ever met someone like that? Not, not even Dutch people are like that, right? You're probably wondering. I could, I could speak with a Dutch accent if you wanted, by the way. But um, the reality is, and this is something behavioral economists came up with um, after I, long after I left college, and that is people are not just irrational. They're predictably, they're systemically irrational, right? And this is something that salespeople and magicians and, um, and, and marketers have known all along, right? Otherwise, why would we have... $4,000 handbags or smoke cigarettes or run marathons, right? We're an irrational species, right? We tend to overestimate our ability to do almost anything. In fact, there's this great study that points out that 80% of Frenchmen believe they're above average lovers. Now, when I, when I first read that, the first thing that crossed my mind, sadly, is I feel really sorry for the 20% who don't think that. <laughs> But the reality is, right, we, we overestimate our ability to predict. By the way, we also tend to choose what we believe based on what people like us believe. And this is a slightly political comment, but I think it's one of the reasons they call it Fox and Friends, not Fox and Facts, right? And, and we also tend to find confirmation of what we believe and what we see, right? So all of these things lead us to ignore change and deny that it's really the issue that it is. And... You know, by the way, this is something that even hyper-rational people do. There's a great uh, German physicist by the name of Max Planck who said, 
science advances one funeral at a time, right? The, the paradigm change is a very difficult thing to undertake. And I had a very direct experience with this actually here in New York City a number of years ago uh, when I was the CEO of Starwood. We had about a $25 billion system and about a $100 million uh, marketing budget, which, or actually media budget, which is a tiny number. And so I was not above doing anything to generate some PR. And we were launching something called the Link at Sheraton, which was kind of like the Starbucks third place idea when acknowledging the fact that we all really kind of work remotely and use our, our devices to, to work while we're ordering a bottle of, or a wine or something like that. And then the whole idea is we were gonna use these lobbies and hotels, anyway. So in order to celebrate this, we had this great publicity stunt, which was we were gonna ring the bell on the New York Stock Exchange from Central Park to celebrate this whole we all work remotely kind of things a few years ago. And we got a bunch of journalists there. And there was really just one problem, and that was it was September 15th, 2009, which was the day that Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. I'm sure you all knew that. Um, and so what happens is all these journalists come, and I'm thinking, OK, I got the link at Sheraton. This is going to be great. Um, and they start asking me, like, hey, the whole financial system's melting down. And I've been media trained, so what do I do? Yeah, it's melting down, but we have this link at Sheraton. So as it's melting down, you can be working remotely, right? And, you know, it was kind of after the fact that I thought, okay, this is really just such a great example of change blindness because I was so fixated on what had to get done, I was ignoring the bigger picture in a pretty dramatic way. So there's one other area that makes disruption such a challenging thing for incumbent companies, and that is the way companies work. It's, and think about this in your own organizations, the KPIs you have in place, the kind of people that you promote, the processes that you have, the sort of skills that you're good at as an organization. Most big organizations are good at a pretty narrow set of things. And one of the things I think that's fascinating is companies like Walmart and Target know a lot about sourcing goods. They know a lot about buying stuff that people want. They're pretty good at logistics, and they haven't been able to mount a serious challenge to Amazon, which as a business model doesn't seem all that far away from what they've been doing. Right, so these are all reasons why this pattern of disruption has repeated itself for a long time. And as I was researching my book, I, f I found this interesting vignette about what was happening to sail versus steam cargo transport in the 19th century. So in 1807, the Claremont's the first steamship that starts to travel across here in, uh, in, on the Hudson River. Uh, and for 100 years, steam basically keeps making inroads. It's a bad analogy. It's not really inroads because it's on the water, but you get the idea, right? They keep, they keep taking share away from sail. And so what do the sailing shipyards do? They don't switch to steam. They keep trying to make a faster sailing ship. And 100 years later, they finally came up with this one ship. This is 1907, the Robert Lawson. It has seven masts. It has all kinds of sails on it. I know nothing about sailing, so bear with me on this. But this was clearly going to be the fastest sailing ship ever, and it was going to compete against steam. And it sailed out into the harbor, and there was a big wind, and the ship went, and that was the end of sail, finally. But this was something that you could have seen coming in the same way, by the way, that Detroit could have seen the same thing in the 1970s with Japanese cars starting at the low end and moving up market. Same thing with steel mini mills and large foundry steel companies. Not a single large foundry steel company actually opened a mini mill as they all went out of business. Think about Toys R Us. Um, blockbuster. This is a pattern that repeats itself over and over again. And in, in addition to the barriers that incumbents face, there are some advantages that the disruptors have as well. And that is, and when I launched a brand at Starwood called Aloft, some of you may have heard of this, as we were planning it, I said, you know, our biggest advantage today is the fact that we don't exist yet and we can invent ourselves for exactly the consumer and the traveler of today. And this is essentially what incumbents can do. They can find businesses to go after with the new technology that's available to them. And it basically follows a few different patterns. One is what I call disintermediation. Basically, if you think about the hotel company I was working with, it was the online travel agencies getting between us and the guests that we were trying to sell to. Uh, Google is basically a giant inter disintermediary for anybody who wants to do e-commerce or direct marketing. Another way that, that software-based digital companies can infiltrate is they can find little piece parts of what your business is working on to unbundle the services that you offer. So in the hotel business, there would be companies that would help hotels just do yield management or optimize their front desk or do keyless entry. 
And you know, in the, in the financial services industry, it's a company like Betterment, which is one of these fintech companies that can do a sort of robo-advising and wealth management. Um, and they can break even, about, even on accounts of about $20,000. Whereas for somebody like Charles Schwab, it's at least 10 times that. So this disintermediation and disintegration can work together. In the travel business, there were companies like TripAdvisor who were doing both. They were getting between us and guests. And they were also, with their online reviews, eroding the signaling power of brands. Because it used to be, if you were going to go to Cleveland, you'd never been there, and there was a West End, you say, well, it's a West End, it must be a nice hotel. That was pretty much as much as you knew. I mean, you probably didn't even look in a travel book, right? Today, you go online, you say, actually, the West End in Cleveland is not in a great location, and it's an old building. I should really go stay at the Hyatt down the street. So the signaling value of brands were less valuable. So disintegration, disintermediation. Um, the other thing that that disruptors can do is, and have an advantage doing is they can create access to assets that are currently being underutilized. So I talked about Uber earlier. Uber basically enables people to monetize their time in their cars, right? Creating access to capital and utilization and, and creating a lower cost model than a dedicated taxi company. And the same thing with Airbnb, which is basically finding empty beds for utilization. You don't have to build a building in a hotel. And what they've really done, too, is they've created elasticity in the short term. So when you're doing a citywide event, suddenly there's all these new Airbnb locations that are online. WeWork does the same thing in a way because they enable companies to rent only the space that they need, not creating commitments over a longer period of time. So there are a number of different ways that d disruptors have a great advantage while these big companies are change blind and focusing on what they've always been doing. Um, now, in fairness to us as human beings and to our organizations, I think there's actually also something at work here, um, which has to do with the nature of change itself. And this sounds a little cosmic. It's actually a pretty straightforward idea. And it, it's based on, on these two observations that I've made about the way change works. And that is, there are trend lines and there's abrupt change. So what's a trend line? A trend line to me is something that's going to go on for a long time and you'd be pretty safe predicting that it's going to continue to do that. So as we're all here in North America, our continent is moving about two centimeters to the northwest every year. And you know what? It's going to do that for a long time after I'm gone. I'd be willing to predict that, right? Slightly less predictable, but also very likely, is that phenomenon called Moore's Law has been going on for the last 50 years. It's probably not going to stop tomorrow, right? Computers are going to continue to improve their performance, at least for some time to come. Global development. Well, there's about 2 billion people in the global middle class today. As people enter into that group, we're looking at another 3 billion people going into the global middle class over the next 30 or 40 years. Probably even if there are wars and other dislo dislocations, that's going to continue to happen. And as a result of that, 5 million people a month for the next 40 years are going to move into cities. These are all trend lines. You can't bank on them for sure, but if you were betting, you probably would bet they're going to continue. The flip side of that is, is disruptive change. So as North America makes its movement, what we can't predict is where and how big and when we're going to get another earthquake. That's an example of disruptive change, right? Um, if you think about what happened with the whole Arab Spring, you had an unstable economic environment for 30 or 40 years. You sprinkle on a little bit of climate change, so you have people leaving the cities and moving, or leaving their farms and moving to the cities. You create a little technology so people can start to talk to each other, and bam, one day, you have disruptive change. And there's something fundamental, I believe, to any complex system that that kind of unpredictable disruptive change will happen. Um, a long time ago, I was a consultant at BCG, and I had to create a model for a factory. And this was back before lean and uh, total quality. Factories had a lot of variability in yield and output and when suppliers would bring things in. And I kept trying to make this model so I could predict what would happen if we improved a few pieces of it. And it was completely unpredictable. It was like this thing had a mind and a character of its own. And you know, I'm this 22-year-old kid out of college. I'm sure there's something wrong with my model, so I spent more and more hours on it. And it was a painful, visceral lesson in the fact that even fairly simple formal systems can create unpredictability uh, and, and other patterns that you wouldn't necessarily anticipate. Um, another example of this is in Yellowstone Park. So a few years back, after a 70-year hiatus, they reintroduced wolves to Yellowstone Park. OK, what would you predict would happen? Well, the deer population would go down, which it did. But interestingly, 
where the deer really started to avoid was any kind of valley enclosed area because due to instinct, I'm sure, they realized they were more likely to get trapped. So the valleys became even more heavily vegetated. There were more, more birds, more trees, eventually more beavers. Beavers built dams. Those dams started to redirect the river. Now, if someone had said to you, we're going to reintroduce wolves into Yellowstone Park, your next thought wouldn't have been, yeah, I bet the rivers are going to change direction, right? You would have been slightly insane to think that, right? So it's just, I think the fact of the matter is that to our credit as, as people, there are challenges about change that are abrupt and inherently unpredictable, which is important to keep in mind as we think about what to do in the face of disruption. So um, there was once this French guy named Napoleon Bonaparte, and he said that the role of the leader is to define reality and to give hope. And so far I've been defining reality and I haven't given you a lot of hope, right? So I want to switch now and talk a little bit about the fact that, yes, there are some things that we can do in a world of unpredictable disruption, even as incumbent companies. And there are patterns of success and successful companies that have dealt with disruption, I think, in very positive ways. And some of the most strong examples of this are the companies that have themselves been most recently disruptors, because being a disruptor, I think they were more tuned in to what disruption looks like. I'm thinking of a company like Amazon, who... 15 years ago was a book retailer and realized, wow, we could be disrupted if someone became a general purpose retailer uh, of e-commerce. And today they're responsible for something like one in every five dollars of retail growth in, in the United States. Apple is another example. 20 years ago it was a struggling PC maker. You know, now it's flirting with 900 billion dollars in market capitalization. Uh, Netflix, remember they were the guys who used to mail you the DVDs? They could easily have been eclipsed by someone who had the idea of becoming an online media company. So all three examples of disruptors who were well aware of the fact that in, in the dynamic businesses where they were, they had to react quickly. Um, but there are examples also of existing companies. And uh, one in an industry that may touch a few of you um, is, is a company called Royal DSM in the Netherlands. And I first started doing some work with Royal DSM about 25 years ago uh, as a McKinsey consultant because they were a state-owned company that had not long before still been a coal mining company. Today, out of 130 chemical companies, they were rated number one in terms of their efforts in sustainability. So gone from a coal company to a sustainable company. Uh, Fortune just published a list of 54 global companies changing the world. DSM was on that list, and not only were they on that list, they were number two behind JP Morgan and head of Apple. So incumbent companies can recognize what's going on and make a change. I also work with another company called Williams Sonoma, which was, as many of you would know, a retailer and a catalog company. Today it's almost 55% e-commerce and thriving in a world obviously dominated by Amazon. Um, and so there are ways for companies to try to compete. And as a CEO of Starwood and looking at the disruption I was talking to you about earlier, I wanted to make sure that we did two things. That we went from change blind to change aware and that we were driving a transformation of our business. And one of the ways I did that is I wanted to focus on what disruption, disruption was teaching me. And so I looked at the online travel agencies, and I learned one thing for sure, which is people love to have price transparency, and they really like online reviews. Well, these are things that we can work on. And by the way, I believe that the OTAs had their weaknesses because they didn't control the experience on property, and that was something we could do. So we could create a stronger barrier to entry against that disruptor. When it came to Airbnb, what I learned was people now love to go places and have an authentic experience, have a real sense of place and a sense of arrival. Now this runs contrary to where the hotel business had been, where they thought what people wanted was consistency in their brands around the world. And today, who wants to fly 10 hours and stay in a hotel that feels like the place down the street? So that was something we learned from the peer-to-peer -peer lodging companies we also felt like our strength was the fact that we did have a staff, we had a gym, we had security, we could take care of a lot of things that the idiosyncrasies of those Airbnb experiences, at least today, still weren't doing. So it was a way of looking at what was happening, thinking about our strengths and weaknesses, and, and creating a response. And I think as you look at companies that have succeeded in the face of disruption, and one of the things that I learned is it really comes down to a few basic principles. Um, and the, and the first of those principles is to overcome cognitive bias by what I call living at the crossroads. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Another is to maintain focus on purpose. 
Because focusing on purpose is not only what motivates people, it's also what drives you to remember our purpose is to fulfill a need, not to be in the business of. And I'll get more to that later as well. And then the final piece is really to put change at the forefront of your agenda. It's about being relentlessly focused on, on being relevant to what's going on today. And, and the, the fundamental collection of those three themes is really about moving from being a centralized, hierarchical, industrial revolution company built around scale to being a horizontal learning organization that pushes decision making to the front line and frankly, mostly into the hands of who your end consumers are. So let's, let's get into each of these a little bit more, living at the crossroads. And I'm gonna give, give you a few different dimensions of that. The first is living at a global crossroads, getting out of your comfort zone by getting out of your geography, seeing how business operates differently and listening to how other cultures respond to that. So when I was at Starwood, uh, at one point, 35% of our growth was coming out of China. Now I said that while I was sitting in a boardroom in Connecticut with a bunch of people who weren't Chinese, frankly no one who spoke Chinese, and a large group of people who didn't actually particularly like to go to China. I said this is a problem because we're today a market leader in this, in this market. We were opening more hotels than Hilton, Hyatt, and Marriott combined at the time. But I said we can do better. And this wasn't the most popular move because it took people out of their comfort zones. I said, you know what, we're gonna move our headquarters to China for six weeks. And we're not gonna do that to oversee what our team's doing there. We're gonna do that to make sure that we learn what they need to continue to be successful. So we spent six weeks there. It was a fantastic experience. Um, learned a ton of things. I'll just give you one example. What we started to see already in 2011 is Chinese travelers were starting to book using their mobile devices. This was before that was happening in, in Europe and North America. And so in order to serve the Chinese market, we worked on mobile booking. And in the next six to 12 months when that became a much bigger thing in North America, we were ahead of the curve. So a couple years later, we moved our headquarters to Dubai, which at the time had more hotels for our company than any other city in the world with the exception of New York. Again, learning about global travel patterns, how to operate in a hyper-growth environment, seeing what it was like to really work in a hotel business where you had not only staff, but guests from all over the world coming in. Uh, and I remember sitting with the, with the ruler, Sheikh Mohammed, and telling him the story about you were only number two to New York. He said, well, when do we pass New York? So it was just, it was, I think, a very valuable experience. And one of the other things to take away from living at the crossroads in a global sense is, it's not just big companies that can do this. I'm advising a, a travel services a marketplace company. Uh, it's a startup. And its first 11 consumers, customers, came from seven different countries. Small companies can be global as well. So there's another form of living at the crossroads, which I think is also important for being able to cope with disruption. And that is at the crossroads of functions. So when I first got to Starwood, we operated like I think a lot of companies did in, in their own way. We had a marketing team where it's a bunch of guys wearing black, smoking clothes, cigarettes in the corner. I'm joking, but they, were, but they were marketing people, right? And they were creating print ads and talking about the brands. Our IT teams were working on these soul-crushing, awful enterprise software solutions um, that cost twice as much and did half as much as they said they were gonna do. Does that sound familiar? So that was the IT team over there, tried to stay away from them. Um, and then our hotels were basically saying, look, Headquarters is such a circus, I'm just gonna run my own hotel over here and hope nobody bothers me from headquarters. So fast forward to seven or eight years later, we're now trying to roll out keyless entry. This was an idea that our marketing, our brand team came up with. They said innovation is really important. But guess what, we need the technology team to make sure that works. And no one's gonna do this unless the hotel general managers have bought off, so we need to bring a few of those guys in there too. So we created, in effect, this small startup, which was a collection of people from all across different functions to try to solve a problem. And remember, most innovation is not invention. I mean, it may be in a science-based company like DSM, but most innovation is about taking basic ideas from different places and recombining them in a different way, right? So one of the other things that happens when you create these internal startups is you give them permission to make mistakes, right? Done is better than perfect. You know, like you write that on the wall somewhere. Which, by the way, if you're in a big company and you have kind of Six Sigma mentality, that's anathema. Right? And that's one of the reasons it's so hard for companies to change. And, and what's hard as a leader is to try to get people to understand that distinction. So one of the things I, I created as a vocabulary was, and I, I borrowed this from, a, from an author, was, you know, anybody here play tennis? 
Okay, so how many times have the rules of tennis changed in the last 100 years? Once. And the change is you can jump when you serve, which, by the way, I can't jump anyway. So really, the the game has not changed for me at all, not that I was playing it 100 years ago. The, The thing with tennis is it's a Six Sigma kind of sport. You work on the fundamentals and just get better and better at mastering a very straightforward game with a simple set of rules. The other extreme of that is something I call selling winter. And it comes from an example of this poor guy who was the head of tourism in the north of Sweden, where he was literally selling winter because there's not a lot else going on in the north of Sweden. And the first thing he did is he said, you know, I'm going to do an ice sculpture thing like they do in Harbin, China. Well, that was kind of interesting. A few people drove by. Nobody spent any money. Okay, that didn't really work. So then he tries an ice gallery. Like he puts some Swedish artists in there. They sell a few things, not much else. So then I think in a moment of utter frozen lunacy, he said, you know, let's make a hotel out of ice. Like, is that the most crazy idea you've ever heard of? And it actually worked. And so the whole point is, these startups are thinking about selling winter. They get to make mistakes and try stuff and see if it works. When it works, we're going to take that and we're going to start selling, we're going to start playing tennis and roll this out across the company, and it better be kind of in Six Sigma mode at that point. But creating the opportunity where we know we're going to make mistakes, where it's okay to do that, and where as a big company we know we can't fail because we're going to lose customers. So that's living at the crossroads of functions. Another area where crossroads can matter too is what I call the difference between old skills and new skills. So new skills are what your kids are really good at, right? Using technology to be able to find new things. And people in our organizations can use that to identify new customers, to create and design and optimize new products, to set pricing. Um, You know, one of the things I say to students when I talk to them after I've given them my career advice is, you know what's really great about being young right now? Is nobody has 20 years of social media experience. Right? You get to work for people and know way more about what's important to them than they know, which was, I don't think, ever really the case in as significant a way in in the history of, of, of corporate life. Those are the new skills. The old skills matter too, though. Making stuff work, getting people to do things. The old skills are what we use to inspire people, They're what we do to build relationships. They're what we do to close the sale. And it's the intersection of old and new skills where success really comes out. And I think one example of a lot of new skills and not enough old ones is the former CEO of Uber berating the driver. You seen that video? Like that's just, if you have good old skills, you don't do that. Even if there isn't a video running, right? Now, an interesting case where old and new may be combining in a positive way is a company like Warby Parker, who are now doing as many sales through bricks and mortar stores as they do online, or Amazon buying Whole Foods. So the intersection of old and new in big and small ways, I think, is really important. So these are all ways for us to overcome our cognitive bias. Um, So the next thing I wanted to talk to you about was this focus on purpose. And, And the reason I wanted to talk about purpose is, so far I've been saying to you that companies, incumbent companies, are facing disruption and it's really hard for them to change, which is true. But what's a fallacy is the belief that human beings don't like change. I mean, if someone comes up with a new product, an innovation, you tend to buy it, right? And you buy it partially because, you know what? If it isn't any good, you won't buy it next time. You have control over that change, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but like when when iOS updates my phone and I can't figure out how email works, I want to throw it in the river, right? Because I can't control that change. So giving people a sense of control is important. And when you combine that with a deep understanding of purpose, you can get people very excited about change. In fact, the best example of people who are change-oriented, I believe, are revolutionaries. Like, these are people who are willing to die for change, right? So the key is not to have people die in your company, which I wouldn't recommend. Um, Still listening, right? Um, The key, though, is to make sure that as a leader, you can talk to your organization and say, here's what's happening in the world. Here's what it means for our company. And here's what we need to do together to make this work. You know, at Starwood, at one point, we did a survey of 140,000 people who had been with the company for more than a year. 91% said they understood the strategy, and 89% understood their role in that strategy. And I think it was all about the focus on purpose, making our guests feel special and recognized every time, and using technology to enable that in a global sense. The key also is to make sure you have people feel like they're co-authors of that change. So we would bring general managers in to work on things like keyless entry so they could go tell their peers, hey, I was part of the team that did that. 
And the whole logic was we're not centralizing or decentralizing anymore. That's an old idea. We are fighting for the triumph of the best ideas across the company and making sure that we share those and start playing tennis with them. So another aspect of purpose that's important is what I call less planning and more strategy. So a long time ago, I was the head of strategic planning at Nike, and we talked about strategic planning like it was one thing. Because I think the paradigm was, back in this centralized, hierarchical, industrial revolution view of companies, that a plan is like a blueprint. This is what we're going to do for the next five years. This is how much our sales are going to grow. This is where we're going to open another factory. Here's when we're going to enter that country. I believe that that kind of planning today is another way of creating change blindness. Because everybody comes focused, like I did on that morning in Central Park, on the issue at hand. I'm trying to do this, you know, uh, link at Sheraton launch the day that Lehman's going bankrupt. Because I'm focused on the fact that today, that's what I'm supposed to do, right? So less planning and more strategy. Strategy is really about deciding what we're going to be good at how we're going to create barriers to entry, how we're going to make sure people can't disintermediate, they can't unbundle what we're going to do, they can't create a lower cost business model, that we can do anything, maybe even get there first, right? And by focusing on, on what we're trying to do, we're not wedded to our existing way of doing things. We're always thinking about new ways of working. So I think the focus on purpose becomes an important weapon, may not be obvious, but an important weapon against guarding against disruption. Which gets me to... The, the third theme here, which is thinking about um, putting change at the front of your agenda. So um, now I worked at Nike for a number of years, and one of the things that the company was intensely focused on, excuse me, was inspiration and innovation. In fact, the, the internal mission was to bring inspiration and innovation to athletes around the world. We were always about innovation. And the way innovation worked there was we had some folks who would work in a product creation lab somewhere. They were runners and they talked to people, but they kind of created stuff. And then every six months, we'd have a big sales meeting in a room even bigger than this, and we'd launch this new technology. And we basically, it's the classic sort of sell your marketing and market your selling and try to get people out there to roll out this new innovation. And I took that lesson when I became the CEO of Coors. And when I arrived at Coors, we had lost market share for nine quarters in a row, and we had lost volume for seven quarters in a row. And I came in as this new guy from Nike. And yeah, I drank beer in college, but I didn't have a beer experience other than that. I guess I had a lot of experience with beer, but not in a business sense is a better way of putting it. Um, and I said, so what do we have in the way of innovation? Have you ever sat in one of those meetings where everybody kind of does this, right? Like, oh, really? Come on. What, where's the innovation agenda? Uh, well, so I said, OK, how about some ideas? And uh, one of our brand guys who'd been with the company for about 30 years said, well, one, once upon a time, we did this red liner for the Killian's can, and, um, and it really held sales. And we could do the same thing with Coors Light, but make it blue. So that is what became the Frost Brew liner. And this is in the years before big data an analytics. And so we based this on this very deep insight, which was guys in North America who drink premium light beer like it cold. Okay. I didn't have to hire McKinsey for that. Um, but we used that, and we said, okay, here's the other problem we have. Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis has 10 times our marketing budget. If we just roll out the Frost Brew liner and it's a good idea, they're going to come up with some other liner and blow us out of the water. So we connected the Frost Brew liner to that idea of guys who like it cold to the Rocky Mountains where we made our beer, knowing full well that Anheuser-Busch, and I always love to say this even though I've been gone from Coors for 10 years, they make their beer in the San Joaquin Valley in Bayonne, New Jersey, so they couldn't exactly talk about pristine water. So this got us from minus one in cans to plus five, which gave us enough time to come up with the um, temperature-sensitive label. You remember the mountains that turned blue? So basically, again, connecting to mountains, connecting to cold, and, and using a simple device there uh, for, for innovation. And what turned out was, and I, I can't take credit for having thought of this ahead of time, waitstaff loved this because they could show up at a table and they could see who needed another beer. And guys who get told, hey, your beer's warm, will order another beer. So waitstaff loved it. It took off. We went from plus one in bottles to plus six. So innovation works. The challenge today with innovation is we can't innovate, I think, all the time in that same centralized, deliberate kind of way. And even when I was at Nike, I became obsessed with this apparel company called Zara. You guys have heard of Zara? Right? 
So Zara was famous for being able to get a product idea to market in 30 days. And we were on this kind of nine-month product development cycle. And so I wrangled some way to go down and visit them in La Coruña when I was based in Amsterdam running Europe for Nike. And I'm sure they did this on purpose when I was touring uh, their site and their headquarters. They actually had different styles that they were knocking off, and a bunch of them were Nike styles. So but basically, they had mastered this idea of time-based competition. And, and the founder is famous for saying that he was not the arbiter of fashion. People were the arbiter of fashion. And he was creating things that people wanted and were selling either in his stores already or in stores around him. So they were constantly looking at what was successful, knocking it off, getting it to market, adjusting it, fine-tuning it, following where people's taste and preference were going. It's a different view from being centralized and hierarchical. The next days after that, I believe is what I call negative response time. So uh, a few years ago, I bought a Tesla and lovely car. But what was interesting about it was the car got better after I bought it. So based on owner feedback, they would update the software the way your phone updates except it was making the, phone, the, 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 the car better. It was doing things like knowing where there was a pothole on my ride to work and changing the suspension for that. Or this is back a few years, integrating my calendar into the screen to tell me where to go uh, for where I needed to be. And now putting in self-driving capabilities. The whole point is that car is better today than the day I bought it. They're selling me a product and saying, we're going to keep innovating on this product after you have it. And again, if you think about a centralized hierarchical company where the CEO or some brilliant person you know, behind the curtain with Oz is making these great decisions, you're now saying, look, you know what? I'm going to let the consumers tell me what to do and serve that. It changes the dynamic of the way companies work. And I think it's one of the things you need to overcome if you want to be successful facing innovation. All right, so I'm going to talk about one more area of holding change at the center of your agenda. And that is it's something I call all about personalization. So, it used to be, and again, go back a bunch of years, and I'm a brand guy, so I'll do this in brand terms. Uh, before the Industrial Revolution, there weren't really many brands. In fact, when I was researching my book, I found a great example of one, which was these swords that these Vikings had. They were called Ulfbert swords. And they were made with a special kind of steel that probably came from Damascus. This is a 1,000 years ago. Nobody has any idea how they got Damascus steel up to Scandinavia. But these swords were lighter, more flexible. Um, they didn't break. If you had an Ulfbert sword and you wrote that on the side of your sword, I bet it scared the daylights out of the guys who were being marauded, right? And it's a great example of technology and branding coming together. Now, what's interesting about that is archaeologists have found some swords where Ulfbert was written on the side, but were actually not made with the Damascus steel. So counterfeiting and branding goes way back before, let's say, China. Um, anyway. <laughs> which isn't really fair because there was counterfeiting long before China. But um, in any case, this whole idea is that branding came to be with the technical innovation of mass production and mass distribution. Because when you lived in a rural place, in a, in a farm or a village, you knew the farmer, you knew the tailor, you knew the chandler, you knew the person you were buying your goods from. You didn't need a brand. You knew the person who was selling it to you. Mass production and mass distribution separate producers from consumers. Brands come into existence as a guarantee of reliability. But there's not much differentiation in media 100 years ago. So they're basically these big brands with undifferentiated products that are kind of mediocre. Now, as we get to more targeted marketing with all kinds of new magazines and color television in the 70s and 80s, brands start to develop positioning, right? They can have personality. They can appeal to people's aspirations and identity. So it's, it's why Nike was way cooler than Adidas or why you'd rather have you know, a BMW than a, than a Chevrolet. It was creating brands that had personality by using technology to do that. The next phase, was in the 90s when the internet suddenly made it possible for companies, for, excuse me, companies, for people, anybody, to learn anything about any company they wanted to. Before that, as a company, you could control the narrative about your company through PR and advertising. So suddenly, if your factories aren't necessarily living up to the values of your consumers, think about Nike 20 years ago, you get punished for that. So suddenly, you now have to reorient your company to think about what people want, even in how you're structured in places that were not obvious at all before. The next phase in this relationship and interplay between society, technology, and brands is personalization. And as consumers, we already know this. We, we expect companies not just to know who we are, where we are, what we want, but what we're going to want, right? Predictive analytics and everything else. Uh, which, again, if you think about the structure of companies, changes the way you have to be organized to be able to be responsive to do that. 
So personalization, and I think this is true in B2B as well as B2C, because if you're in a B2C business at some point, somebody's B2C, if you're in B2B, at some point you're talking to somebody who's B2C, right? They're gonna be wanting to personalize. And so if you're a supplier to them, what better thing to do than to be able to help them to start to personalize? So these are just some of the different areas, some of the themes I wanted to talk to you about in terms of how to cope in a disruptive world. Again, thinking about living at the crossroads to overcome cognitive bias, focusing on purpose to be able to drive change, and then putting change at the forefront of your agenda and thinking about personalization and ways to adapt your business. So um, as, I, as I wrap up here, I'll, just, I'll leave it with you this way, and that is I hope I defined reality and spent a few minutes giving a bit of hope and remind you that the new definition of insanity in this age of disruption is to keep doing the same thing and keep expecting your sales to grow and your business to succeed. That you have to think and work differently from before. And with that, as I understand it, we have about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A. So Amanda is going to lead us through that. Thank you, Fritz. All right, where is our first audience question going to come from for Fritz today? Do we have uh, any hands in the audience? And I'm perfectly comfortable, by the way, cold calling people. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Including you, Amanda. Just no, <laughs> oh God, no. Uh, <laughs> there's somebody out there with a better question than me. We have a hand down here in the middle. May we, c'était très intéressant. You were very much a leader. Um, I have a question to you about the interplay of policy with disruptors. Uh, as you said, you ran uh, Starwood, and uh, you spoke about Airbnb quite a bit and Uber. Um, how do you deal with the fact that you allow governments or regulators, allow disruptors to function in a different reality than that which they've imposed upon uh, organized companies like Starwood or like your taxi cab licensed drivers who have much higher costs, much higher regulatory um, impacts on them uh, across the board, especially in the hospitality business, et cetera. And isn't it, a, isn't it the responsibility then of the government to reduce the regulatory environment and the um, the costs of those traditional suppliers to allow them to compete. In other words, you know, what you're doing is you're disadvantaging people through public policy. Yeah, I, I think that's a, it's a great question and I think extraordinarily relevant uh, in today's environment. I, I took one political science class in college and I remember one sentence from that political science class and that is that regulation always lags behind society because the, the wheels of government move more slowly than society. Now, in, in a world today where change is accelerating because of technology, businesses hopefully are getting better at being adaptive. I'm not sure that we can say comfortably that the wheels of government and regulation are accelerating either. So I think we're seeing an ever wider gap between the regulatory frameworks that we have in place and, and what those frameworks need to oversee. And, uh, it's, it's an interesting thing because in the hospitality business, we as the hotel companies were trying to use regulation, I, I'm speaking a little bit candidly here, as a way to try to fend off Airbnb. And we would point out, I think legitimately and rightfully, you know, we have fire life safety, uh, we have uh, all kinds of inspection of the rooms that we have that, that need to sort of live up to certain standards. And the peer-to-peer -peer business doesn't do any of that. And by the way, they, they don't and didn't in every case pay the same taxes that we did. Um, and then I think there are a few lessons that come out of that. First of all, using regulation to try to protect your business, even like the taxi drivers in, in Paris in Operation Escargot, is almost doomed to fail. Because I think that the power of change and the voice of people ultimately will, will overcome any regulatory barriers you can put in place to stop change. I mean, even the tobacco companies, it took a long time, have had to lose ground. Um, but I also think it's important for us as citizens to keep in mind that when we look at new business models, we should be actually supporting changes in oversight and regulation that create the same safeguards that we want on the one hand, but don't stifle change and prevent this kind of creative destruction on the other side. And I think that 
I mean, there's a lot of things that we could probably say about government today, and it, it's very quickly kind of a political conversation. But the fact of the matter is, I think this chasm between where the business world is now and, and the regulatory environment that we have is, is becoming ever greater. And it's making government, I think, look pretty silly sometimes in trying to enforce things that are no longer relevant or having no voice in enforcing things that are relevant on a daily basis. All right. Do we have any other hands in the audience? If not, we have a few questions coming in through the mobile app, it looks like. Uh, so we'll turn it over to the first one there. You talk about blind spots. What potential blind spots are prevalent today in food and beverage? Food and beverage industry, I guess. Yeah, you know, I think one of the really interesting things in food and beverage, and I'll, I'll say this from a brand and consumer perspective, is the fragmentation of media and the availability of social media has really tilted the advantage away from the big brands. So if I think about the beer business, with the exception of Germany, pretty much every large country market around the world was dominated by two or three beer companies that had between 80 and 99% of the beer market. And the reason for that, I believe, is fundamentally about the fact you could buy national advertising. In some cases, there were some other nefarious things going on. But it was about being able to buy national advertising and sponsorship and basically dominate the marketplace. Now, if I want to open a microbrewery in Brooklyn, I can do that, and I can reach out to the millennials who live in Brooklyn who might want a gluten-free beer or whatever crazy idea they have and target marketing very specifically at doing that in the same way I did when I launched my book. And so I think one of the blind spots that the big companies have today is they disregard the power of creating brands basically without any of the barriers and structure that were there before. In the, in the footwear business, you see this with a company like Allbirds, which is selling shoes made with wool out of, out of New Zealand, it's, you know, gotten to you know, a few hundred million dollars in revenue. Anastasia in, in cosmetics doing the same thing. The barriers to entry for big brands, I think, are very different from where they were before. And it's one of the reasons I think a lot of the larger food and beverage companies are struggling in, in this environment. Uh, another area where I think this is an issue is in some of the transparency and, and some of the complicated issues. So a, a, a bigger topic than, than for the next few minutes, but if you look at the, the nuanced view of GMOs, which is there are some not so good aspects to GMO and there are some positive aspects, the ability for consumers to understand those nuances, if they really care about that topic, I think are much better than they were before. And it becomes, I think, an opportunity for smaller players and disruptors to exploit or take advantage of segments of the population that have a different view on some of those basic topics. All right, do we have any other hands in the audience? Or we can go back to our mobile app questions as well. How can we prevent the erosion of our brand given multiple digital intermediaries? Yeah, I think what's interesting is um, in, in terms of the, the, the the, uh, the, the disruption of brands today and the role of intermediaries is it goes both ways. So at Nike, the company was built, and one of the genius things about Nike, and I can say this because it wasn't my idea, uh, is they outsourced production and they didn't own retail. And so Nike could always focus on selling products that were selling and not having to fill stores or keep factories running. So they could keep the brand exclusive and hot and in demand because they could control production and they didn't have those economic pressures to do that. And when the ability to sell e-commerce came along, it was a real change to the way we thought about things because suddenly we didn't need the retailers. And the whole question was, was that a problem for us? Now the reality was, it was a great advantage because we have been selling at wholesale to retailers all this time. Now we could sell direct to consumers at full retail price and capture all that extra margin at a relatively lower cost of distribution because having, having a single point of e-commerce sales is much better than building a few hundred stores and having to staff them. So you know, there are times when actually technology creates opportunities for brands to disintermediate. On the other hand, in the travel business, as I mentioned before, we had the online travel agencies. And in that case, what we wanted to do was essentially focus on what we were best at doing and make sure that that created a stickiness with travelers. And so, I wasn't above, for example, if someone came in through booking.com and paid a really low price at one of our hotels, giving them not necessarily the best room. Whereas someone who was a plat, a platinum traveler, 
or an ambassador traveler, these people are traveling 50 or 100 days a year, and I'm sure some of you in this room are like that, knowing who you were and what you liked, and by the way, it was usually a short list of things that really mattered to you, like, hey, I'm allergic to down, or I really hate the noise of the elevator, or I'm scared of sitting in a room that's way up high. Just giving you those things and knowing, and you knowing ahead of time that we were going to take care of that created a stickiness that prevented someone like an online travel agency from getting between us and, and that consumer. And I think in any business, you need to think through who the intermediaries are, what they do, and also what are ways that you can maintain connectivity uh, to, to your end consumer. All right, we have another question coming in through the app. What is a developing disruption in Asia or Europe that hasn't made its way to the US yet? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the, the broader lesson here is that in developed markets like North America and Europe, um, it's very hard, actually. It's, there's much more playing tennis in markets that are mature and advanced than there are in emerging markets. And so in some ways, I think the interesting distinction here isn't necessarily always what's happening in Asia versus here, but it's in markets that haven't developed, that are leapfrogging, that create new opportunities for different ways of working. And, um, and new business models have an ability to jump more quickly as, as a result of that. And so um, you know, what's interesting is the European hotel market, for example, came in, into being in the, eight, the 1800s and the early part of the 1900s where there weren't hotel brands. So 75% of the hotel base in Europe is unbranded. In the US, brands became an important part of development and that became something that now is, is spreading to Asia. What's interesting now, I think, is with this sense of, uh, of place that people want to have and a rejection of big brands, the interesting development now that you see in different points around the world are actually individual, boutique, cool hotels that are coming and creating that sense of place and identity. So we bought a company called Design Hotels, which were a collection of 300 properties by a company started in Europe. They were all individual that celebrated that owner of that hotel who had a real focus on design and the particulars of that local market. And so it's that backlash, I think, that came out of a market like that that, that was really interesting for us. Um, it, it, you know, if you look at Asia, I think the more interesting thing that's been happening is uh, the disaggregation of the way workflows operate and the ability to do more things remotely and in a centralized fashion. And I think that's something that uh, in a structured environment is harder. And again, just to use a hotel example, most hotels here grew up with the idea that you're going to have a hotel, general manager, you'd have a head of food and beverage, a head of HR, a head of finance, a head of operations. Hotels today can basically operate with one leader and a bunch of people providing services, and pretty much everything else can be outsourced to a different provider. And, and that's an innovation that has come much more out of Asia and then in Europe than it has here in North America. And I think that disaggregation of work and workflows and what you have to be able to do is, is one of the changes that, that we need to be thinking about. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, another one through the mobile app. What is the next disruption trend? That's a tough one, and I think there's a lot to choose from, from the Internet of Things to AI, big data analytics. One of the ones I think that's very interesting today is what's going to happen with blockchain and, and cryptocurrencies. Because if you think about how much, and I should be careful because I know we're at a Rabobank meeting here, but I think what's really interesting is how payments change when there's less friction and different ways of keeping track of value. And uh, I know that as a, as a merchant, when someone came in with an American Express card, we were losing 3% on that sale. And it wasn't obvious to me what additional security was really being created by that. You know, if you're in the Netherlands today and you use a debit card, it costs you 12 euro cents independent of transaction size. So if you were using your Amex card to buy something there, which by the way, the merchant wouldn't accept probably, it would cost you three euros, whereas it was 12 euros. It's a 96% increase, or it's 4% the cost of one method versus the other. That friction, I think, over the volume of payments that are happening around the world is pretty extraordinary. And so I think there's, but of course then we have the issues of safety and security and, um, and, and, and service that are preventing that change from happening. But at some point, a little bit along the lines of North America moving at two centimeters a year and nothing happening for a long time, at some point I think this whole world of payments and how we think about that will change in a radical way. 
Um, but in the spirit of not knowing how these disruptive changes really work, I'm going to recuse myself from giving you a picture of really what that future looks like. So. All right. 